Thank you very much, uh, Your Eminence. Uh, when you mentioned I was a friend of the, this diocese from the very beginning, it reminded me of once uh, a student wrote on a paper about Jeremiah. He had to write about Jeremiah, so he said, <clears throat> Jeremiah was called to be a prophet from before he was born. And he said, Lord, I am too young. Uh, um, So I was a friend of this diocese before it was born. (laughs) The Diocese of the South was in my heart before it was born. In fact, I I remember, I maybe should say this tomorrow night at the dinner when it's a little lighter, but I remember... uh, one in All-American Church Council where they were electing a metropolitan and uh, at the time His Grace Bishop Dimitri got almost all the votes. Uh, but however it happened, uh, someone else became the metropolitan. And I don't know if you recall, but I remember going to you after and I was saying, anybody could be the metropolitan, go down south and become a saint. <laughs> Because they had announced, I believe, almost immediately that the Diocese of the South would be founded. I think it, was, it might have been even at the very council after the election, if I'm not, or the next meeting of the bishops uh, uh, all uh, synod, synod. Yeah. So it's much better to come to the South and be a saint than to be a metropolitan, you know. Uh, in the old days, uh, when... Uh, our dear Vladika and I were together doing so many different things together uh, up north. Um, during those days, I was beginning and um, uh, being prepared pr- primarily by Professor Serge Sergeyevich Verhovskoy, whom you remember also. Uh, and I'm sure some of you in the room remember him. <clears throat> I was talking with the brothers about him today, telling about him. Uh, but uh, he was preparing me to be a professor of dogmatic theology. Uh, and um, I spent hours and hours with him personally. It was almost like a tutorial. And I feel in many ways my theological teaching is his. Uh, he was very eccentric, very little well known. Other people were much more known, Father Schmemann, Father Meindorf, others. But he wasn't very well known. But uh, I always felt that um, my vocation in life, at least part of that vocation, was to be his spokesperson, his mouthpiece. Uh, and I, I kind of thank God for him at this point too, thinking back in those days. But one of the things that uh, Prof, we used to call him Prof, Professor Verovskoy uh, made me do, he made me swear, you're not supposed to swear, but he said it's okay this time, economia. Um, uh, but he made me swear that uh, I would never uh, present uh, my own personal opinions uh, as a teaching of the church. That my task as a professor, a teacher of dogmatic theology, and I can never think of H.L. Mencken who used to say as boring as a professor of dogmatic theology, um, but in teaching dogmatic uh, theology, um, he did promise, almost I had to write in blood, uh, that I would never present anything as my, uh, of my own opinion as a teaching of the church. And my task in, in the classroom uh, was to try to, dis- to determine what is the teaching of the church and what isn't, and why it's the teaching of the church, and to try once to determine what it is, then to explain it as well uh, as possible. But even, even there, uh, there is still the issue of opinion, because people do differ in their opinions about what is a dogma of the church and what isn't. I mean, you may know there are some Orthodox who think, for example, the old calendar is a dogma of the church, you know. So there's a debate about what is a dogma of the church and what isn't. But it was a little bit of a, uh, um, how can you say, very controlled thing because when all is said and done, uh, there was plenty of clear doctrinal dogmatic teachings of the orthodox tradition of the scriptures the fathers the canons the liturgy the icons everything that testifies to faith that would fill up more than any kind of number of hours you would need in a in a classroom and i begin by that tonight because uh tonight 
I am not teaching and even pretending to teach or to speak about any dogma of the church. Father uh, Seraphim said that I could pretty much do this evening uh, whatever I wanted. Uh, and he suggested to me that uh, the first night, Monday night, we were speaking with the young people about life. What is life? What makes life, life? Uh, and he thought that I would uh, maybe um, use that same topic tonight, and in a sense I will be, uh, but not directly. What, what I want to do tonight, and the other day some of the brethren were asking me, what are, what is, how was I going to use this time? And I joked with them and I said, well, I think I want to use it to give you a piece of my mind. <laughs> uh, and the peace of my mind, in this sense, would be uh, with uh, the blessings of, uh, of uh, uh, His grace, His eminence, and the blessings of Father Seraphim. Uh, what I would like to do is, is, in a sense, a very simple thing, but a very complicated thing. Uh, and it's not at all... Uh, it's up for grabs. It's, it's for debate. It's for, uh, it's for your own thinking when you go home. But what I'd like to do is just share with you what I think is going on right now in our world. <laughs> and I'd like to share with you what I think we, who are in this beautiful cathedral church in Dallas, what we should do about it. <laughs> so how's that for a topic? <laughs> What's going on in our world? <laughs> What's going on today? And here I would, uh, oh, thanks so much. Yeah, uh, what I would, uh, what I would, I would qualify that by saying what I think is going on in Western European, North America, and Australia, basically. What's going on in the so-called Western world? What is happening in our time? What have we gone through? Um, and how should we as Orthodox Christians relate to it? See, how should we relate to it? Now, to relate to something properly, you have to see it clearly, right? St. John Chrysostom, in his treatise on the priesthood, he said, if you're going to apply, um, uh, give a person medicine for an illness, you better diagnose the illness correctly, because <laughs> you could kill them. Or if you're going to do surgery, you better know where to cut and you better know how deep, and you better know what you're looking for, otherwise you're going to harm the person. So the first thing that we have to have is a kind of precise, clear vision, uh, at least as well as we possibly can, and there's no dogmas about that. <laughs> that's charism, that's discernment, that's the Holy Spirit, that's whatever it is. Uh, but we have to try, uh, I believe, uh, and certainly the pastors do, and, 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 and uh, the leaders of the church, have to try to discern the times. What's going on? What makes people tick? What's happening to the people and the people who come to our churches? What is influencing them? What has happened in the culture that we should really be aware of if we are going to try uh, to relate to them. Uh, we spoke with the priest today about uh, the sentence of St. Paul uh, in the ninth chapter of the Corinthian letter, which I'm always, uh, I'm always, Vladika, as you know, I always like to find out, Vladika writes um, commentaries on scripture, but it's always fun to look and to say, where is this read? Okay, we have, you know, we have feast days and so on. Where is this read? Well, there is that, there is that uh, um, part of the 1 Corinthians 9 that for all the church fathers is almost like the Magna Carta of, of, of pastoral, and I would add parental life, because <laughs> parents are pastors. <laughs> um, of not only their kids, but their wider community and so on. Uh, that's part of their being baptized, the royal priesthood we were talking about. Uh, but he said... Um, that uh, what he was called to do was not only to put no stumbling blocks in anybody's way, uh, not only to, to present anything that was non-essential as essential. You know, he says, if somebody be scandalized by what I eat, I won't eat it, and, you know, and all this kind of thing. But then he said that he was called uh, to be to all persons 
uh, to bring to them the gospel of God in Jesus. And he said, so to those under the law, I became as one under the law, but myself being free from the law, to save those under the law. To those without the law, I came, became as one without the law, being myself still a Pharisaic Jew under the law. Uh, to the weak, I became weak. And then he says this famous line, I became all things to all people, so that by all means I might save some, <laughs> not all. <laughs> So that I would be, and more accurately, even according to his own teaching, that I could be the instrument of God in the salvation. Because he never thought of himself as a savior. In fact, he thought of himself, he spoke about himself as an abortion. <laughs> One on timely born. In the Greek word, that means abortion. <laughs> but he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And he says, I'm not interested in, in what you have. I'm interested in you. So you've got to be interested in them, but you can't be all things to all people if you don't know who those people are. If you don't know what they're thinking about, what forms them, what makes them tick. Why do they say what they say? Why do they do what they do? Why do they act the way they act? You know, because if we're not understanding that correctly, well, the chances are we're not going to cut in the right place and we're going to give the wrong medicine and we're going to be part of the problem. Uh, so what we have to do is to try to get together uh, just to, uh, um, to try to say together, do we see with one mind? Would we interpret the sign of the times the same way? Would we see what's going on the same way? And if we don't, then we have a job to do. We've got to talk with each other. Uh, but then even if we do... What do we do about it? You know, what then should we do? And that's an incredibly important question. It was not only asked by Lenin, stop jealous, you know, what to do. And boy, he had a solution. Um, um, but that, yeah, could you somebody give me a little, something a little closer? To put? But, yeah, thanks. Yeah, my hands are getting cold. Um, but as you may know, reading the Holy Scripture, when the Apostle Peter gave the very first sermon on that Pentecost Sunday, when the Spirit had been poured out on all flesh and he preached that the one who was crucified is raised and glorified, when he finished, a voice from the crowd said, What then should we do? Because it's all about what we're going to do. And as we said this afternoon, we will answer at the last judgment by what we do. Kata erga, according to works. That's in the Psalms, that's in the Proverbs, that's in the letter to the Romans. <laughs> you know, that's in the, the Apocalypse. We will answer for what we have done in the flesh. That's what God is going to ask us. But in order to know what to do, we've got to see things clearly. Otherwise, we're like, as the Russians say, Gustumania. We're like geese in the fog, going around and messing up people's lives, you know. So... I had a friend, Father Berzansky, he used to say, the priests are ordained to help the people to suffer. And boy, do we do that. <laughs> um, um, but we don't want to help people to suffer. We do want to help them in their suffering. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so what I want to do now, in, in an incredibly simplistic manner, is just tr to try to share with you what I think where we are now. Like what's happening um, in our so-called culture. <laughs> and then just say a few things about what I think we have to do about it. Um, having worked in school all my life and a school teacher, uh, we're very uh, sensitive to plagiarism. So I just want to go on record by saying, you know, that what is plagiarism? Plagiarism is when you take a couple of people's ideas and you present them as your own. <laughs> well, what do you call it when you take a lot of people's ideas and present them as your own? <laughs> That's called research. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I would like to confess, full disclosure, that tonight's talk is more plagiarism than research. <laughs> I'm going to present uh, uh, ideas of other people. And in that sense, nothing that I'm saying here is my own or original. 
But I do think that I can put together some people's writings who have witnessed to what's going on in various different ways. And perhaps for the sake of a you know, half an hour talk, uh, I could put something only to help you as a kind of guideline to see if you think that this is so. And I'll tell you the names of some of those people. First of all, they're my own teachers. Professor Verovskoy, Father Schmemann, Father Meindorf, Dr. Arseniev primarily. Zizi Ulis I had as a teacher once. Uh, also, um, writers like uh, Thomas Merton. Uh, artists like Flannery O'Connor, who was introduced to me more than 25 years ago by uh, Father Paul Yerger. He gave it to, a book of Flannery O'Connor to me as a gift. I've never been the same since. <laughs> We spent two months together when Father was coming into the Orthodox Church. He came to uh, our uh, house to live. And when he left, he gave me a book of Flannery and wrote inside the cover, In Pursuit of Wisdom. Because <laughs> uh, Flannery, one of, she has these incredible stories, a southern writer. But there's other writers. Solzhenitsyn would be here tonight. Dostoevsky would be here tonight. Uh, but more than anyone uh, would be in another way in the spiritual world would be the arena of Branchaninov would be here tonight Um, but perhaps more than anyone else would be C.S. Lewis in the book The Abolition of Man and the writings of a rather unknown person but I think he's one of the geniuses of the end of the 20th century his name is Carl Stern He was a secular Jew neuroscientist who survived Hitler because of an American fellowship. He was a total Renaissance genius man, uh, and he went through uh, from from atheism through prophetic type of fiery Judaism, and then ultimately became a Christian, a Catholic. But he was actually converted through the Russian writers. (laughs) And he has three books that I, if I could order people to read, I'd ask them to read them. One is his spiritual autobiography called The Pillar of Fire. Another one is a critique of Western culture called The Flight from Woman. Strange title, but it's a great book. And another one was called The Third Revolution. And it had to do with psychoanalysis and the modern culture. But primarily, uh, what I will share with you from Stern which is very similar to Solzhenitsyn and very similar to the abolition of man by Lewis and very similar to many others uh, is a letter that he wrote to his brother who was on a kibbutz in Israel, a Zionist which is still quite relevant if you look at CNN and read that newspaper they stick under your door free of charge every morning over at the hotel if you could handle it But C.S. Lewis in 1944 and Carl Stern in 1951 predicted everything that's going to happen, that's happening right now. Unbelievably, in my opinion. And so did others in other ways, like Solzhenitsyn, like Flannery O'Connor here in America. And basically, um, I'm just going to tell you what their prediction was. And then I hope just to say a couple of things about if it is right, what do we do? So jealous. You know, what do we do? What to do? Um, in doing this, <laughs> um, I don't want to blame them for anything I say. Okay, so read them yourself. <laughs> but this is, the, this is what I got from it. In his sermon this morning, <clears throat> Father Paul um, used the uh, expression postmodern. Postmodern. And in the jargon, you know, there's always jargon, right? The jargon of the time in, in the Western world. The thinkers like to speak about where we are now in a period of postmodernism. And it's sometimes hard to get a handle on what that will actually mean, and it probably means different things to different people. But it also uh, begs the issue of what was modernism, <laughs> if it is postmodernism. 
And certainly if it's a, a postmodern, then we would have to say that it is post-Christian as a culture. But I will argue tonight, according to these sources, that it is worse even than post-Christian. It's post-human. Post-human. <laughs> and so what, what is it that's claimed? In 1944, C.S. Lewis was reading a grammar book of teaching grammar in the British schools. And he said that when he started reading this grammar book, he discovered the book was not about grammar. It was presenting in a subliminal, insidious way, if that's the right word there, help me, Vladik, if it's not, you know, secretly destructive and you're not even aware of it, a poison into the life of those students who were reading that grammar book. And he said, and if this... If what is taught in this book becomes part of the system of people and they grow up, it will be the abolition of man. He said humanity as we know it will no longer exist. And my thesis is that it happened. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> It's a very tough book. It's very slim. I thought I brought it up, but I brought another one by mistake. It's in my bag over there, wherever it is. I can get it. This is not a bad one either, speaking the truth in love. But, um, <laughs> but it's a very thin book. It's in there? Oh, goodness. I didn't bring it. Sorry. I thought it, I, I took it wrong from, from home. Oh, no, it's right under my paper. There it is. <laughs> See how thin it is? <laughs> it's a tough book. I've read this eight times in the last by three months and I still don't get the middle part. <laughs> but I got enough of it to give a talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what he says is a very simple thing. And, 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 and he does it a lot better than I'm going to do now, so forgive me. You know. But what he says basically is this. They're teaching grammar. And they're teaching about how to describe a huge, magnificent waterfall, cataract, a waterfall, majestic waterfall. And then these authors of this book are saying, well, someone said, what do you think of that? He says, oh, it's kind of pretty. Another one says, gee, it's nice. And then another one says, it's sublime. It's sublime. And then they start saying, you know, what is the right word for the waterfall? And then he said, well, pretty, nice, this, that. Then they get into Wordsworth, this, that. I don't know why. It gets kind of complicated at that point. But then what they say is certainly this majestic waterfall can be described as sublime. But then the authors of the book go on to say, however, of course, they're not saying anything about the waterfall at all. What they're really saying is, when I look at the waterfall, I have sublime feelings. C.S. Lewis at that point says, they don't know the English language. You can't have sublime feelings. <laughs> you could look at the waterfall, think it's sublime, and then feel humbled or, or uh, touched or overwhelmed. But you can't have sublime feelings, so they don't even know how to use the language. He said, but what they're trying to say is, there isn't anything in that waterfall. All they are, quote-unquote, merely speaking about is what they feel about it when they see it. And so there isn't any objective reaction that a human being should have when they see this majestic waterfall. All they do would utter in one way or another what they feel about it subjectively, and it is merely thrown in there, so it has a kind of debunking character to it. It doesn't really matter what you're saying anyway, because all you're saying is what you subjectively feel, and the other person next to you could feel something different anyway, and the waterfall does not demand and elicit any proper reaction from you when you observe it. He said... If that ever wins, it's the end of humanity. Why? He said, because there's a faculty inside a human 
that he in the book calls the Tao, the Tao. And he did it, I think, on purpose because he says, this book is not about Christianity. I'm known as a Christian speaker. This has nothing to do with Christianity. This has to do with the philosophy that's behind this grammar book. And he said that in every culture of humanity up until his 1944 period, every culture was founded on a conviction that there is a faculty that is in human beings that is the faculty that makes them human. (laughs) And that faculty is not their brain, it's not their reasoning power, and it is not their sense experience. It's a deeper reality that is meant to organize, order, develop, cultivate, refine the thinking process and how to handle the sense experiences that you have. In fact, it's that faculty that provides the axioms for thinking. That's where you get the the first things, to use Aristotle language. That's where you get the basic realities. And he said, different cultures called it different things. He said, some cultures called it the image of God in a person. Some cultures, like the Bible, called it the heart. The heart. You see? Sometimes in biblical language it was called... In Romans 2, the law imprinted on the heart. The so-called natural law. Uh, in, 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 uh, in Greek philosophy, it was called logos. Uh, in, in Asian, it was called the Tao. But it was this intuitive faculty which makes a human human. Because without it, without it, the brain would just be like a machine. And the senses would be nothing but sensations and experiences. And he says, we are not machines. We are not angels. We're not animals. We're not plants or or rocks. We're humans. We're humans. And I believe that in our tradition, that particular faculty would be called the heart. But in some patristic authors, it's called the noose. The inner intuitive faculty that Plato even saw in his uh, famous uh, Republic uh, provides the insights into the realities upon which then you can argue. But you can't even have a meaningful argument unless you are, are having certain basic insights that you can share and agree are good, true, beautiful, or at least demanding admiration, demanding honor, demanding obedience, you know, that there is truth that there is beauty, that there is good, then you could argue about what it is or what it isn't. But that, but that intuition that that is there, that's the foundational reality. And he said, if you destroy that, you don't have human beings anymore. And then he said, and if what is taught in these grammar books catches on... It will be the abolition of man. And so the first lecture in the book is called Men Without Chests. Because he, is, he located that faculty here. Not here. Not down there somewhere. You know, but here. You see? And that, and that is that unique, unique faculty. But then he went on to say... And I don't want to spend too much time on what he went on to say, but although it's very important. But what he went on to say was, if that is abolished, then we're nothing but a brain and a body. And uh, I've been using this uh, in some of my sermons and talks lately, and I went a little bit further. Because I don't think he saw the cybernetic age. He didn't see where we are now. He certainly didn't see it in 1944. But I think that what, what we could say in our North American society now, you're not only uh, um, a brain and a body. And by the way, one providential thing was when I was reading this book, I think for the fifth time, uh, I, saw, so I, I saw a clip, uh, a, a, a piece in the newspaper that I actually cut out and kept. It was about an artistic production in England which was called A Festival of Brains and Bodies. <laughs> um, talk about prophecy. <clears throat> um, 
But I like to go further and say what that could mean more, and perhaps a little more incisively, that we are nothing then but a computer. A computer and a consumer. We consume goods and we compute. And we compute on the basis of what we feel, think, want, whatever. And, and if I'm really on a roll, forgive me, I'm in the church, but I said it already here, so I've already got the wrath of God upon me. But actually what you end up being is nothing but a calculator and a copulator. That's it. And I am convinced that there's many people who are already older... They're not just kids or college students. They're in politics. They're in government. They may even be in a White House or whatever. Um, who are no longer human in the classical sense of the term. And when C.S. Lewis was making this argument, he said at one point, Well, some of you who are listening to me might say that you're calling these kind of people evil. Wicked. You're saying they're wicked men. They're evil men. He said, no, 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 no. You didn't understand me. I'm not saying they're bad men. I'm not saying they're wicked men. I'm not saying they're evil men. What I'm saying is, they're not men. <laughs> so words like good, evil, bad don't even apply. They're just not the same of what we thought humans were. But then he went on to say, that however, because you cannot obliterate this towel completely... And we would say, theologically, you can't erase the image of God in a person completely. So what happens is an oligarchy, that means a rule of a small people who have the power and the money, are going to take their calculations and their sense experiences and their way of looking at reality, and they're going to foist it upon all the other people. <laughs> and then he called them conditioners. Carl Stern would call in his writing, he called them managers. <laughs> But the human isn't there anymore. And then it's all an ideology. But then it is based on calculation and consumption. It's based on consuming and copulating. It's based on what my friend, Father Paul Laser, and please continue to pray for him. You know, after having two hips replaced, he decided to ride his bicycle and broke his leg. <laughs> um, but he would call, we used to call in the seminary together, Father Paul and I were our best friends, and Father Bishop is a great friend of Father Paul, lived in the same house with him. But I think you would agree that although he and I are very different as human beings, we're still one soul and two bodies. Right? <laughs> He's the kind of guy like you can be in church together and look at each other and you know exactly what they're thinking. Um, by the way, that expression is from Gregory the Theologian's funeral oration on Basil. And it's on John Cashin's funeral oration on Germanus. One soul and two bodies. <laughs> but anyway, Father Paul, we came up with what we call the PP words. <laughs> Power, pleasure, possessions, properties, profits, positions, <laughs> prestige. And if you want to really be Greek Orthodox, presvia, <laughs> honor. <laughs> Who sits at the table first? <laughs> That's what happens. But then this oligarchy starts deciding of what that's going to be for people. And they're all do doing it under the benign understanding that they know better. And by the way, some of you who are more into the literary um, uh, 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 CS rather than this, uh, this um, more scholastic one, I was told by someone, I don't know this, but somebody told me that this same thesis he presents in artistic form in the book called The Hideous Strength. But I'm not aware of that. But in any case, what he says is, they will rule. And what they think that they're going to do with their calculation and their, and their, and their power is that they're going to vanquish nature, he said. They're going to come overcome nature. He says, but what they're going to end up and realize is that nature ends up vanquishing them. And then it's over. It's a kind of a grim book. <laughs> Very grim book. Uh, but he still presented it as if this would catch on, if this would happen. Well, I just want to share with you my opinion. I think it happened. I think it happened right before our eyes. Because then, by your calculation and your sense experience, you can recreate re reality any way you want it to be. Because it's merely your opinion anyway. There is no sublimity to the waterfall. It's your feeling. 
So if I don't know, if I feel like I don't know, I'm a um, woman trapped in a man's body, I can go get an operation and become a woman. If I say that, you know, God made me, I don't know, a heterosexual lecher, well, if I want to do that, I can do it. And, and the only curb still left in Western society is you've got to prove that you're not hurting someone else. <laughs> and, of course, that's what's behind the abortion debate. Is a fetus someone else? Is an old person dying someone else? Well, if they're not someone else, you could liquidate them. <laughs> So who is a person then? Well, I decide what a person is. I decide what my sexuality is. I decide what I want to choose. I I construct myself. And this is and this is what the 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 result would be. And here I would say, um, with a little bit of an apology to Father Paul uh, in his sermon this morning, that in this particular point which is beyond modernism. And I'll tell you in a minute why. People wouldn't care if we build a beautiful building like this and have a vigil in it. In the modern world, they would think we're nuts and if they could kill us, they would. And of course in Soviet Union, they did. 70 years, 70 million corpses. Just to say, we made a mistake. (laughs) But what did they put in his place? And what will they put in his place? And the jury is still out whether what the prison camps could not accomplish in the modern age, the computer chip, the investment, and the American businessman, and the American film, and the American art, and the brains and the bodies, will accomplish the abolition of man. Because no prison camp ever abolished humanity. In fact, it enhanced it. Read Solzhenitsyn. (laughs) So, here we are, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I would say, uh, vis-a-vis the sermon, uh, and Father Paul, I'm only picking this up because it helps me tonight. Father Paul was worried in the sermon that people would say, Oh, you think you're true. You think you're right. You think you have the beauty. You want to tell everybody what the truth is. Well, we're democratic. We don't do that. You know, we have ours, you have yours, and so on. But then there would still be a fight, if you were still in the modern era, there would be a fight of whether you're right or wrong. In the postmodern, there is no fight whether you're right or wrong. There is no fight if you're right or wrong. Because they will say, if you like to do that, and that makes you feel good, and that brings you the pleasure that you want, and it makes you help you cope with life, go there. Dress up like the Byzantine emperor. Make smoke. Kiss pictures. uh, Do what the heck ever you want. Just don't tell me that I have to do that. Well, in the modern world, they would say, don't tell me I have to do that. Yeah, when I was young, they would say, don't tell me I have to do that. Don't make universals out of your own particular convictions. Nowadays, but, excuse me, but in the modern era, they would add, don't tell me I have to do that. And you shouldn't do it either. If you were a smart person formed by, you know, Newton, Marx, Freud, Darwin, you shouldn't do that either. And they would fight with you about it. And if they got in power, they would stop you from doing it. And if they really picked up one of those revolutionary views of man by like Karl Marx, they'll put you into prison and kill you. Well, not in the postmodern world. In the postmodern world, they would say, they would not say, you don't tell me I should do this. But I'm not going to tell you that you can't. If you want to, do it. Why? Because it doesn't mean anything anyway. (laughs) One guy calls the waterfall sublime, the other guy calls it pretty, the other guy calls it nice. And after all, they're only speaking about their own feelings merely about them and if we really have a free society let people do in private with consenting adults whatever they want except there's a hitch you got the oligarchy who have the power 
And so the rhetoric will be, oh, if that turns you on, go ahead, do it, and so on. But there are limits to that. Like if you bring your children into it, or whatever else. So it isn't as innocuous as it first seems at all. But one thing's for sure, it's the end of humanity. If that happens. And I think it happened. Now Carl Stern, he put it a different way. In the letter to his brother, he said, The modern, and he was in the modern world still, he wrote this book before there, was, there were computers, let alone the word wide web. All he knew was a television set and an airplane. But he saw it all. And he said that he believed that if the Western culture continued the way it was going, and don't forget, communism was still in power at the time. It was just after Nazism. He escaped to Canada, as I mentioned, because he had an American fellowship and they didn't dare kill him. They killed the rest of his family. But he said in a letter to his brother, and his brother was on a kibbutz in Israel uh, uh, fighting for the rights of the Jews and, the, and, and, you know, never forgetting the Holocaust and building the state of Israel and all that kind of thing. And he wrote his book, The Pillar of Fire, because he would go to these scientific conferences of neurosurgeons and psychiatrists and all that, and he would meet his old friends, Jews mostly, who survived the camps. And they'd say, oh, Carl, how are you? What are you doing? What's new? I'm in Canada. They didn't kill you. They didn't kill me. Oh, isn't it wonderful? And then he would say, and sooner or later, they would say, well, how are things going? What's new? And he knew that at some point he'd have to tell them, I became a Christian. <laughs> a Catholic Christian. And he said that every time he would do that, they would sort of stop, look at him and go, oh. And he said, I'm writing this book about that, oh. I'm writing this book about that, oh. But in the end, he wrote to his brother, who couldn't imagine why he did what he did, and considered him an absolute traitor. And his whole point was to say to his brother, I am not a traitor. I am the one who's following Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, the Psalms, the prophets. Because the only way you can follow them truly is to be a Christian. But then he wrote to his brother a few pages that I will now share with you. He said, There are only five possibilities for Western European American, and I would add Australian, because they're, they're totally Americanized by now. And by the way, this is being spread all over the globe got to get rid of a few fundamentalist Muslims, but sooner or later we'll, we'll bomb it into them. <laughs> um, uh, he said that there are only five possibilities that he saw as available to people. One, obviously, was to be a straightforward, biblical, Nicene Christian. The incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit, the sacraments, the prophets and the saints, and the mystics. That's one possibility, he said. And of course for him it was the only one. But what were the other four? The other four were, the second one, at least in my numbering for tonight... He said, probably a lot of the people will just kill themselves. <laughs> Suicide. He said, they might not actually kill themselves. Except that Father David, who's shaking his head, told me the other day, because his son got his driver's license, that one out of four teenage di drivers totals a car in America nowadays. The highest death rate between 18 and 22 is suicide. And that's not even counting those who do die on so-called bad drug trips and, 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 and automobile accidents. <laughs> it's just the, the, those that can be documented as, in fact, a conscious act of suicide. But Carl Stern said, yeah, people are just going to kill themselves. They just won't be able to take it. They won't be able to cope. They won't be able to do. They'll be so messed up. He said, however, there's other ways of killing yourself. And to quote my friend Father Paul, you can kill yourself on pee-pee. <laughs> Power, possessions, profits, pleasures, 
just carnal out. Because the pain is too great and you've got to kill it. So you kill it by working 20 hours a day. You kill it by making it. And in his book, uh, 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 Flight from Woman, he said, and what had happened in Western culture, and he analyzes Descartes, he's the big guy, uh, Sartre, Schopenhauer, Goethe, Kierkegaard, Leo Tolstoy. The best, best essay on Leo Tolstoy ever written is in that book, The Culture of Woman. And basically what he ends up saying, at least in my interpretation, is, the fallen male became the image of success for everyone, including women. The fallen male, the corrupted male, the male who destroyed the Tao, who destroyed the image. He says that's what's going to happen. And that's, that's an expression of Solzhenitsyn also. Solzhenitsyn spoke about human beings bezverknava etaja, without an upper story. They're nothing but flesh and blood and guts and tommy guns and madness. And of course he was in the Marxist madness. And when he gave that famous Harvard speech, and he said, what has gone wrong? What's the matter? He said, you could talk about detente, open diplomacy, enlightened self-interest, spreading democracy, freedom, whatever. He said, but the Russian Baba in the village knows what's wrong. Said when there's trouble in the village, they just make the cross, shake their head, and said, "Ani patiriali obras, ani patiriali podobia." They lost the image, they lost the likeness. They're no longer godly people. They're no longer human. Solzhenitsyn's boys with the Tommy guns are no longer human. But we should remember, they are all baptized Orthodox. And by the way, another person who's in this talk this night is a lady called Alice Miller who writes about childhood and child abuse and all that comes through this society that produces virtually hatred of children. Hatred of them to the point where, as Pope John Paul said in his Evangelium Vitae encyclical, The Gospel of Life, you can judge a society by how they treat their children and basically these societies kill their children that they don't want. One way or another, but they kill them. Well... <laughs> He says that when they've lost this image, then what's left? But Alice Miller, when she speaks about child abuse, for their own good, you shall not be aware, read these books. And I'm afraid that in reading them, we will see a lot of our own story in that book, and we'll see a lot of our own behavior either. Because, brothers and sisters, we are also tainted by all this stuff. We are, more than we think. But anyway, in one of her books, she wanted to show the two most horrible examples of the modern world, not the postmodern, but the modern world that she could think of. So she did analyses of Stalin, Ceausescu, and Hitler. Madmen. But let us in this holy cathedral remember that two of the three were Orthodox. They both were seminarians. <laughs> and Ceausescu was the son of a priest. A PK. Yeah. So, here's where we are. So he said, you could kill yourself. Or kill your kids, or kill each other, or, or live in total oblivion of each other. And John Paul Sartre said, even to prove that you're really a free person, you've got to kill the other person. L'enfer, c'est les autres, he said. Hell is other people. They're looking at me. You know? Well, don't look at me. Well, we come to church and say the psalm, look at me. <laughs> you know, look on me, O Lord. I'm, I'm told, but there is one psalm that says, turn away and let me die already. But, um, uh, but he said, we're just surrounded by being and we're, uh, you know, crazy man. But they're all nuts. But what, what, what it, it is is what I'm trying to say here at this point is you can kill yourself without literally killing yourself. You could kill yourself on work, on drugs, on sex, on, on, on just serving and being a brain and a body, a calculator and a copulator, a computer and a consumer. That's all you are. There's nothing human left in you. And then, as a matter of fact, in scriptural language, you're already dead. You could be existing. We talked with the kids the other night about a difference between existing and living. There's a big difference. 
And according to our view, you're only alive when you're in communion with God and filled with the divine energies and full of grace and dying to yourself in love for the neighbor in imitation of the crucified Christ. That's what we believe. Well, in the modern world, they would have said, you're nuts, and if you believe that, we're just going to kill you. In the postmodern world, they'll say, you really believe that? Well, that's really crazy, but if you want and it turns you around, that's fine. That's the difference. Because it all doesn't mean anything anyway. Now, in the modern world, that got us to the postmodern world, according to Stern himself in, in the book, The Third Revolution, he said, there's actually four revolutions. There was the Copernican Revolution, which up until then, everybody thought the planet Earth was the center of the universe. Then you discover we're not. We're just a speck floating around in 100,000 billion galaxies, 100,000 billion stars is going to blow up sooner or later because of the laws of entropy or something. So then you have what he called the nothing but. Ah, we think we're the world, but we're nothing but. And Schmemann used this, Father Alexander, used this word in his book for the life of the world where he said, as a matter of fact, humanly and scientifically, we are nothing but a whirling cemetery (laughs) filled with dead people's bones and brothers and sisters. (laughs) Scientifically, biologically, we're all dead people. We can move around, calculate, copulate for however we want, but we're dead. We can even serve divine liturgies every day. We're dead. Unless it isn't just nothing but that. Well, there's other nothing buts. The Copernican Galilean revolution did it with the cosmos. Darwin did it with biology. We're nothing but the survival of the fittest. (laughs) Nothing but accidents of history because our neck grew long so we could eat and the others didn't, they died. Uh, You know, beautiful. It's like Soloviev said, you know, let us, we're all descended for age, so let us love one another, you know. Uh, (laughs) But I think we, with Stern, would have to say, these guys didn't see nothing. There's scientific truth there. Their problem wasn't the scientific truth. Their problem was the philosophical and metaphysical conclusions they drew from it, which were unwarranted even logically, let alone theologically. Let alone that there's an intuition in an upper story that is supposed to, in C.S. Lewis's words, guide and guard and shape how we understand that data. But once the heart is gone, the noose is gone, it's nothing but data. Nothing but, nothing but. We're nothing but a planet whirling through space. We're nothing but accidental, you know, processes of biology or something. Then Marx came up with his nothing but. Socioeconomic. We're nothing but a dialectic of material history because of economics. And, and, and if economics, and that's, you know, and all of these things have so many inner contradictions, they're not even funny. You know, you could ask Darwin, how could you write that book if you're nothing but? But um, with Marxism, they're even even contradiction, certainly in the Soviet form, of killing people. Why should they kill people? According to their theory, it's all going to die out anyway. Religion is not only the opium of the people, it's a superstructure that's going to just disappear in time when the proletarian revolts and all that kind of stuff. But the point was always made like by Father Bulgakov, Fedotov, and others that Russia was the least likely place to have a Marxist revolution on earth. It was an agrarian society with 80% peasants who half of them were just freed from slavery and couldn't even read and write. Well, it's pretty hard to have all the workers of the U- 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 work unite when that's what you've got. But of course, like so many of our ideologies, it was made in a library <laughs> uh, in London. But um, at the same time, at the same time, he didn't see nothing either. He saw poverty. He saw workers. I mean, I always thought to myself that if my grandfather didn't leave Nevitsky and come to America and father Alexis Toth and, I, and my mother went to a funeral and came home and got pregnant and said, this boy's going to be a priest and here I am. Uh, talk about Flannery O'Connor, man. <laughs> um, um, wise blood. Uh, I, I probably would have been a communist. Sometimes I really think if I'd stayed there, I, I might have easily... Because my, my forebearers were bonded serfs until the generation before my great-grandfather and, and, and uh, were, you know, my grandmother couldn't read or write. 
My own mother went to sixth grade. My father's father died when he was 12 and he had to go work in the factory and, and you know, was an angry guy. And, and when he had free time, his father, when he wasn't beating them, sent him up to the church to watch the church because they were building the Russian Orthodox Church and the Ku Klux Klan were burning crosses on the lawn in Endicott, New York, upstate New York. Believe it or not, you know. Uh, but I could have easily been that, I think. You know, one flick of a, of, a, of a movement and, you know, only God knows. So there is divine providence. So there is something to that. Well, what, what um, Carl Stern said is, you can kill yourself. And many people will opt for that. And I would go and say another outrageous thing. I think a lot of people who come to church are killing themselves too. The only thing is their drug of choice is religion. Not booze. Not work, not money, because they probably don't have enough money for that. So they come to church and play a role and, and eat up the priests and, and check out the music and, and they feed their addiction every Saturday night and Sunday morning <laughs> to deal with their pain. But then he said another option, this was 51, don't forget, is Marxism. But he dismissed that with like three sentences. He said, it is so rotten to the core that it's going to die out by itself. So probably it doesn't have long to live. And I don't think he would imagine that it would only have been 30 years or so. You know, I, I don't think, of course he lived into the 60s. So he saw, he saw, you know, he wrote this book 10 or 12 years before he actually died. Uh, but in any case, he says, Mar Marxism is rotten to the core and no one will probably take that very much, except a few professors in Western universities. <laughs> um, but then he said, I don't know how much I'm talking about. Then he said, an option, however, especially when Marxism implodes, and by the way, you know, everybody praises you know, Pope John Paul II and Ronald Reagan for bringing about the fall of communism. And I'm sure they did their, their duty. But as a matter of fact, communism imploded because of its own inner rottenness. It was because of, of Chernobyl, which is, by the way, the name of Wormwood in the apocalypse <laughs> um, uh, in the Bible. But in any case, uh, he said uh, Marxism, is, some will still choose that. But it, it's doomed. But then he said, there's another one that once it does fall, it's going to create incredible uh, agony, suffering, and pain. And this is where he nailed his brother. And that one was, he said, nationalism. Nationalism. Everybody's going to say our people, not those people, not those others. We have it. We need justice. And justice, well, as Camus said, justice is when both sides are right. <laughs> uh, I mean, tragedy is when both sides are right. But on the other hand, unless that is broken by grace, he said, it'll just be a mass of blood. Go home and turn on the TV. Baghdad, Iraq, Lebanon, Palestine is still going on. But it's going on in our world, too. Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, is going on in church. Everybody asks, why are we not one in America as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church? Very simple answer. We don't want it. And why don't we want it? We don't want it because of the peepees. We're not going to give up our presvi, our power, our position, or anything else. We like our life. Anyway, they're not really orthodox. <laughs> The Russians say that about the Greeks, the Greeks say that about the Russians, the Arabics say that about both, and here we are. And the only one true church is I don't know what. But nationalism, he said, and he said he was afraid that that was going to be a real horror. And the nationalistic people, they're not even in the Western European, American, uh, Australian thing, except by extension. However, the oligarchs, who are, are, are no longer human, are also nationalists. <laughs> and there's an American nationalism too. <laughs> but I'll leave that one to go to the one that he thought was the worst of all. He said the worst thing that's going to happen. He said, and don't forget, he only saw the TV set and the airplane. <laughs> he had no idea of cybernetics. 
he said, but there is going to be an intellectual movement fostered by all the problems that the modern world has created. Marx, Darwin, Freud, uh, psychoanalysis and all these kind of things because they're not going to hold up. Newton was already falling apart. Darwin was already in the scientific world was falling apart. The pop world it didn't. And then he said um, and what's going to happen is there's going to be in a global experiment led by the West that he called scientific pragmatism. Rationalistic pragmatism. With that brain and with that body and with those machines, we are going to think that we will solve all the human problems with no reference to the upper story at all. Except for people who in their private life might want to go to church and sing in Russian or something. But that's not going to be the functioning, motivating power in them. And he said that this scientific pragmatism is going to be tried on a global level it's going to be spawned in the West and pushed on the West of the rest of the world. And he said, and when it hits its apex, the evil and the pain and the suffering and the madness that it's going to cause among human beings will make Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia look like a kindergarten. That's what he said. And then he says, and he says, and if it wins, this and not material destruction, and then he used the very words of C.S. Lewis, will mean the end of mankind as we know it. Well, I'm afraid we're into that full force. We're into that full force. That's the, that's the dominating mood. In, and so if you if you just look at ourselves and look at our parishioners, who do we have? We don't have many Marxists left. We have a lot of people killing themselves. We have many nationalists. But most of the Americans who've been to college are scientific pragmatists. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> so it seems that that's what postmodernism is. Nothing but. And it's also debunking. Always debunking. The, the waterfall. It's nothing but my feeling. The cosmos, it's nothing but planets whirling around. It's nothing but processes of biological evolution that are totally accidental and so on. It's nothing but the dialects of history and economy. What is it? Well, we'll handle it with our science, our rationalism. But the rationalism and the science and the pragmatism won't have any intuitive insight that will form it and keep it human and allow it to be used for good as it is supposed to be. Because these things are not evils in themselves. They're not evils. To be Russian is not a sin. <laughs> right? They're not evils in themselves. Although Irene, who became the Metropolitan, said, Grek at the Grek. <laughs> Greek, that's a sin. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> But there we are. Now, I would just hold, I would just claim tonight, I'm sorry I'm going on so long, I'll just claim tonight that that's where we're at. In, in a whole complex entangling of that that is working differently in every single human being that you see. But what you could say for sure is that our children and our students, they're being raised in this. They are being raised in this. They are. And I would even say that all our troubles, even as churches, are because of this. In one way or another. Now, I didn't leave myself much time to say what to do about it. So I can just quote the saying of a desert father named Pombo. <laughs> this Pombo was a great guy. I love him. Disciple of Anthony. In fact, uh, he asked Anthony once, What did the God do to, to be saved and please God? Anthony said to him, Whoever you are, never forget God. Keep God before your eyes. And by the way, he didn't say orthodoxy, he didn't say the Bible, he didn't say the liturgy, he didn't say the canon law book, he said God. He said, whatever you do, do according to the Holy Scriptures. Again, he didn't say the fathers, he didn't say the canons, he didn't say the rules, he didn't say what Baba told you. 
He said the Holy Scriptures. And then he said, in whatever place you are, don't leave that place easily. Because the devil will have you jumping around like a yo-yo. But then Pambo said to Anthony, what should I do? And Anthony said, as for you, Pambo, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. Don't trust in your own righteousness. Don't be anxious about the past. It's over. And guard your mouth and your stomach. Well, I would say if we did that, we'll be okay. But I want to quote Pambo. Because one of the lines of Pambo was, he said, and this is deep, mystical, magnificent orthodoxy. He said, if you have a heart, you can be saved. That's what he said. If you have a heart, you can be saved. So the question is, do we have a heart? You can't preach the gospel to people without a heart. (laughs) They don't have antennas to receive it. (laughs) So then what do you do? Do you shut up? What do you do? Well, you make an act of faith and say, you can't kill that heart completely, whatever C.S. Lewis or anybody else says. (laughs) Maybe you can. Sometimes some scripture passages make you think you can. Driven by the wind, creatures to be raised and shot or something. You know, it's not very nice. The apocalyptic writings of the Bible. Uh, However... What we have to do is a very simple thing. We have to make sure that we have hearts. We have to be sure that we remain human. We have to make sure that we remain sane. And my friend Father Paul, who's on my mind these days, he once was asked at an ecumenical meeting, what is the fruit and contribution of being orthodox? And he said, to preserve people's sanity wholeness. It's only when you walk in here, see all of this, hear these sounds, that you know why you have a brain, why you have sensation, why you have eyes, why you have ears, why you have a nose, why you have a mouth, why you have a chest. you got to have a chest, right? Why you have everything you have. Simeon, the new theologian, even gets into other parts of the body in rather great detail. Why you have You know what you have hands for. You know you have walks for. And they were all anointed with the Spirit of God. And and that you 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 are told that you are made in God's image. That you have this faculty of insight into reality that can order everything. From scientific study in the lab to looking at a waterfall. It's there. And that is what makes us human. And that is what the crucified Christ guarantees to us. But he had to be crucified for us to have that. And it's so interesting. I once read all the Psalms in terms of the heart. Enlarge my heart. Purify my heart. Wound my heart. Illumine my heart. Cleanse my heart. My son, give me your heart. But probably the most important line of it all would be, Break my heart. Because the only sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken heart. In fact, Barsanufius and Barsanufius and Johnny said, You have no discernment and you're in total darkness until your heart is broken. Broken how? By a double power. The mercy of God... The magnificence of God and the misery and wretchedness of what we are without Him. Well, this postmodern world has removed Him in a more insidious way than the modern world. Because in the modern world, all they could produce were martyrs. (laughs) Now, I didn't have, because I didn't time myself well here, I didn't have a time to get into how I think religion in American life has fed into all of this. It's just another version of it in many, many ways. Whether it's liberal or conservative, whether it's fundamentalist or, or, or new age or whatever, it's been poisoned by this immensely. Because the big mistake there was to fight the modern world by making the Bible into something it was never meant to be. 
The Bible was about the heart and the intuition, not about evolution and days and, and planets and so on. It was a pseudomorphosis and a blasphemy of major proportion. What happened? And that all happened because at one point in Western church history, people began to read the Bible like the Muslims read the Koran. And if we had time enough, I could prove to you that Sola Scriptura came directly from the dialogue between the medieval schoolmen and the Muslims. Our Bible is not a Koran, and our word is not a book. It's a person. It's a person. And it's a person who has a heart. <laughs> it's a person who's human. Now, what do we have to do then? Well, we have to do what hopefully we preach in our churches all the time and hopefully practice. Pray. You know, struggle, think, study. You know, don't be a fool. But most important of all, we have the heart because the heart is where you see. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see. It's interesting, in Hebrew there's no word for mind. You know, the Shema of Israel says you shall love the God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your flesh. There's no word for body even. Basar is the only word they have. Leb is the only word they have. And that is interesting. The Greek New Testament put mind in there because they want the Greeks to understand what they're talking about. But mind is not in, in, in the Deuteronomy. Because the heart is that central function. That heart is the faculty that the modern world has... We made a cardiectomy. We removed the heart and are no longer human. But we have to hang on to that heart because that's what makes us human. But that heart is not only an effective organ. It's not it's emotional or effective at all. Pascal was wrong when he said the heart has reasons the mind doesn't know. That's part of the problem. Our fathers say the mind descends into the heart. And there you see God and pray and have an intuition of reality. But it needs to be illumined. It needs to be enlarged. It needs to be cleansed. And most of all, it needs to be broken by the love of God. So the last, and, and I really have to end because I'm going too long. But the last word is, it's all about God. And God is love. I can't resist saying that someone asked our son Johnny, he's a priest. Probably sat on your lap in Wappingers at one point. Certainly was altar boy with you. Um, said to him, what's your dad doing now that he's not teaching class anymore and being the dean of the seminary? He said, I don't know what he's doing. He said, but rumor has it <laughs> that he's traveling around taking every opportunity that he can to remind Orthodox Christians that church is about God. <laughs> Church is not about church. The Bible's not about the Bible. The icons are not about the icons. The liturgy is not about the liturgy. Theology is not about theology. It's about God. And it's about the merciful, loving God who becomes a man and dies the most vile, despicable death on the planet Earth so that we could be human. Not just divine, because you can't be divine unless you're first human. I quoted Callistus Ware the other day, who always used to say, We all know as Orthodox that God became man to make man God. But we should also remember, God became man to make man man. <laughs> We are not human without God. That's the whole point of tonight's talk. But people don't kill each other anymore over that. They say, if you want it, it's okay. And then provide something else. So the final word is, you can't teach people this. You can't beat it into them. You can't do it by legislation. You can't do it by bombs. You can't do it by gimmicks and tricks. You can't do it by seminary classes and pastoral theology, alas. Um, you can only do it by love and love is suffering love is sacrifice but love is what makes us godlike and we begin loving in our own homes with our own kids that's where it all starts and that's where it all ends because there's nothing beyond that but once that happens once we say to God, God, let me be a human being. Let me be your child. Let me love real people with real love. Then the Baba in the village says, no problem. <laughs> because we're human. But without that, but still that begs one more question. What is love? Everybody's for love. Madonna's for love. Brooklyn's for love. <laughs> 
Saddam Hussein and Samullah bin Laden are probably for love in their own understanding. But for us, love is the figure of a dead Jew, a corpse, hanging on a tree of a cross outside the holy city of Jerusalem, betrayed by his own people, killed by the Gentiles in the most vile death that a human being can die. And until we die that death, we're not human. And that's why we're baptized into the death. And every time we come to the church and sing holy, 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 we eat the broken body and drink the shed blood until he comes. And as long as that's going on, then the rest is up to God. But it's for us to make sure that that is going on. And that's the only thing we really care about. And that's what the church is. And we could talk about financial problems, bishops, this and that. Nothing can stop us from doing that. Nothing. So I think, I'm, I'm convinced, at least in my own mind, that's it. But that's everything. So, thanks for listening. You want to have some give and take <laughs> a little bit? Who's, who's, who's watching the clock tonight? Father Seraphim, where are you? <laughs> Father Joseph? <laughs> Father Hopko, yes. Nicodemus, Father Joseph, 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 Diana, you just gave me the opening I was praying for. <laughs> In the arena... St. Ignatius branching enough claims that he can't find a monk in Russia who's interested in God. Or his neighbor. They're interested in everything but. He, sp he spends the first 50 pages of this book trying to convince monks that their rule is the commandments of the gospel. Yeah, he does. I quoted 20 times in the first 8 pages he uses the expression Yevangelsky Zapovidi, the commandments of the gospel. And then he has, and it's written for monks, it's called An Offering to Contemporary Monasticism, written in 1867. And he describes how the devil gets them. And he's describing monks, but I think it could, it could just apply to every single one of us in this beautiful cathedral right now. Especially those of us who are wearing cassocks. I'm just going to read it to you. He said, look, brethren, look what the devil is doing, has done, and will do. Leading the mind of man from the spiritual heaven to material things. Chaining the heart, the heart of man to the earth and earthly pursuits and earthly occupations. Postmodernism says, after modernism, there isn't anything else anyway. <laughs> There's nothing but. You can think it's a neurosis. I mean, I forgot to mention the, the, the revolution not only of Darwin and Marx, but of Freud. We we're all the products of, you know, sexual libido because of how we were treated in our mother's womb or something. Well, there's a lot of truth to that. But if it's nothing but that, then he says, Look and be alarmed with a healthy fear. Look and beware with necessary soul saving caution. Then he starts. <laughs> The fallen spirit busied certain monks with obtaining various rare and costly things. Then by attaching their minds to these things, he estranged them from God. How much did these icons cost? <laughs> How much do these icons cost? Where are we going to get the money for that? You know? Others he employed in various studies and arts. Where's Vladimir? You're the arts and I'm the study. 
theology, I can not whatever. Anything, anything, so long as the aim was earthly. Then having drawn all their attention to passing studies, he deprived them of the vital and necessary knowledge of God that is given in our church through prayer in the heart. <laughs> Others he employed in obtaining for the monastery various improvements. Buildings, cultivation of flower gardens, kitchen gardens, pastures, meadows, cattle breeding, dairy farming, and forced them to forget God. Ani zabrili boga, ani patriali obras. They forgot God. They lost the image. <laughs> And he's monk. He's talking about monks. Others he occupied in decorating their cells with flowers, icons, pictures, making fine furniture, prayer ropes, rosaries, and withdrew them from God. As one of my friends says, how many people there are today who are interested in the Jesus prayer? But very few are interested in Jesus and prayer. <laughs> um, <laughs> Others he attached to a lathe and taught them to ignore and neglect God. Others he taught to give special attention to their fasting and other bodily exercises. And he's got a whole chapter on bodily disciplines. And I'll just summarize it to you in three sentences. He says this. He uses the parable of the sower. He said, you can't bring those seeds down into the garden and you can't make them grow. Only God gives them and it's grace and it's the irrigation of the Holy Spirit that makes them grow. But what you can do, and this is where asceticism comes in, you prepare the soil. You deepen it, you throw out the rocks, you throw out the weeds, you cultivate it. He said, however, if you had a farmer who just threw seeds all over the place and never cultivated the soil, nothing would grow. On the other hand, if you had a guy who all he did was dig and manure and power and water but never put seeds in, the guy would be mad. So he says in that uh, interpretation of the parable of the sower, bodily disciplines are means to an end. They're not the end. They're not the spiritual life. They're the means to the end. In fact, I think I want to even... Excuse me for doing this, but it's just too important. Um, I want to read you what he actually says there, so you'll know that I'm not making this up. Uh, and so he says that the bodily disciplines is only the cultivation of the soil. And he said, like St. Seraphim of Saroff, our patron said, the, 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 the spiritual religious orthodox life is not about fasting, praying, and, and, and going to church and standing and lighting candles. It's about the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. But all those things are a means to the end. But they're only a means. So Ignatius says this. Uh, he says... Um, Bodily discipline is essential in order to make the ground of the heart again. The heart fit to receive the spiritual seeds and bear the spiritual fruit. The spiritual seeds are the words of God. The spiritual fruit are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. St. Seraphim again. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, fidelity, and self-control. And I was very impressed that one of the young girls the other night knew that. Galatians 5.22. He said, to abandon or neglect bodily asceticism is to render the ground unfit for sowing and bearing fruit. Excess in this direction or putting one's trust in it is just as harmful, now listen to this, and even more so than neglect of it. He said, neglect of bodily discipline makes people, men, like animals, and Chrysostom would say, don't say that, Ignatius, animals do what they're supposed to do, who gives free reign and scope to their bodily passions, but excess makes them like devils, and fosters the tendency to vanity, pride, and the recrudescence of other passions of the soul. So then he says, those who relinquish bodily ascetical discipline become the subject of gluttony, lust, pornea, anger, greed, in their crudest forms. Peepees. Those who practice immoderate bodily discipline or use it indiscreetly or put all their trust in it, seeing in it their merit and worth in God's sight. We stand long in church and we don't sit down and we fast two days a week and even others and we do everything. We're orthodox, right? It says, leads them into... Listen to this. Makes Romans 1 look like a kindergarten. Vainglory, self-opinion, presumption, pride, hardness, and obduracy, contempt for their neighbors, detraction and condemnation of others, rancor, resentment, hate, blasphemy, schism, heresy, self-deception, and diabolical delusion. Prelists. 
And then he goes on in another place, by the way, in this book, to speak about psychic zeal. That's not pneumaticos, but psychikos. Not duchovni, but duchevni. And he says it makes people just irritated, angry, judgmental, legalistic, but they think they're zealous. And then he quoted Romans uh, 10, chapter, first verse, where Paul says about certain Jews, I bear witness to them that they have a zeal for God, but it is not katepignosin, it's not according to knowledge. RSV says it's not illumined. And therefore, in their zeal, they replace the righteousness of God with one of their own. So, he, so he's, he's really down on animal zeal too. But this is what he, he says. And then he went on to say that no schism, division, or problem in the church ever was perpetrated by an alcoholic, a drug addict, or a prostitute. <laughs> it's all done by ascetical monks and bishops. <laughs> um, who are not interested in God. Well, I'll continue and then we'll really stop because I know I'm getting, I'm getting darting looks over here. Others he taught to give special attention to their fasting and other bodily exercises. And listen to this sentence. And to attribute special significance to dry bread, mushrooms, cabbage, peas, and beans. That's what they worship. <laughs> And in this way, sensible, holy, and spiritual exercises are turned into senseless, carnal, and sinful farces. The ascetic is corrupted, reduced to carnal, falsely called knowledge, conceit and contempt for his neighbors, which snuffes out the very conditions for progress and holiness and provides the conditions for ruin and perdition. Others he inspired to attach an exaggerated importance to the material side of church services. while obscuring the spiritual sides of the rituals, thus by hiding the essence of the Christian faith from those unfortunate people and leaving them only a distorted material wrapper or covering, he enticed them to fall away from the church into the most foolish forms and clouded perceptions into heresies and schisms. So that's what happens when you don't exercise asceticism with theocracies, with discernment. In St. Anthony the Great, in his sayings, he said, many monks have achieved asceticism, but very few have discernment, and they remain far from God. And Syncletica, because we have to have equal opportunity in the postmodern world, Amma Syncletica in the desert said, for a monk or for a Christian, obedience is higher than asceticism because obedience leads to humility and asceticism leads to pride. She said it. I didn't. So, but this is, this is what we have to do. But we're walking a narrow path because it's got to be about God. It must be about God and nothing else but God. So I think we really better stop. Huh? Yeah.